If you take your Bibles with me and turn to Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, I'll pull your Bible out. Uh, there's a message outline we sent out via email. It's also on the website and in the YouTube link. And so I encourage you to have your Bible, especially in the message outline ready. And by the way, you know, some of you are relinquishing the right of the remote this week. And some of us will be gathering in person for our many worship services. But for those of you who are listening online and watching online, you still have the right of the remote, right? So you can just click me off, click. I hope you don't do that. Um, I won't know. But uh, with our folks meeting in person on Sunday, I will know. And I'll just keep going even if you bring uh, folks bring those remotes. But here we are in Luke chapter 18. We're at the end of the longest section of the Gospel of Luke, uh, finishing up the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And next week, we begin really a shorter section of the record of Jesus' time in Jerusalem in the midst of increasing rejection. But this week, we have this wonderful, this great section. It's really the highlight of the whole book, apart from the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it's the keynote of the Gospel. It's where a key verse resides. And Jesus teaches and teaches and teaches and teaches over and over and over again. Salvation is available to all. It's a free gift. Choose to respond in faith. Then let that faith show. And we're going to see it just over and over again. We're going to cover most of this section uh, together. So we cling to Jesus as seeker and savior. So look with me at verse 9 of chapter 18. We, we, we cling to self-effort for certain failure. And that's this first section from verses 9 to 30 in chapter 18. And we're going to start right there in verse 9. We rely on mercy over merit. And we beg, we don't boast. And we're just going to capture a key truth in each of these little stories. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector right here. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And when we see Pharisees and read Pharisees today, we kind of think that they were bad folks. But remember, very respected in their culture. So the contrast is very real as, as Luke writes this and as, as he records what Jesus did. But the tax collector stood at a distance. And then and now, you know, we don't like tax collectors so much. And he would not even look up to heaven. But beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so Jesus instructs, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified, thus declared right with God. The one went home right with God, the one that had all the fancy stuff and the self-righteousness, not so much. He went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And folks, key truth from this little story and if we want to we're, if we want to cling to our self effort we're certainly going to fail in our relationship with the lord and he says he teaches us that we rely on god's mercy not on our personal merit we beg for mercy we don't boast about all the good we've done god's not impressed and he expects us to come to him when we receive forgiveness of sins begging and asking for mercy like this tax collector, God have mercy on me, a sinner. So we don't want to cling to self-effort for certain failure. We don't want to boast about our accomplishments. We want to ask for God's mercy. Well, it goes on. And so Jesus and, and Luke give another example, verse 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And parents would come and they'd want Jesus to bless their babies. And, and when the disciples saw this, they thought, well, you know, Jesus is too busy. He's got other things to do. And, and so they rebuked these parents. They rebuked them. Verse 16, but Jesus called the children to him and he said, let the little children come to me. So I, I love that Jesus likes babies, right? He likes kids. And he says, don't hinder them. 
For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. You know, I put on your outline is this. We recognize total dependence. Humility, not hubris. Not this kind of cocky spirit that, of course, God's going to accept me and I'm going to come to God strutting my own stuff. No, that's not it at all. We come in humility and we recognize our total dependence. And I, it's like a, a, a baby. And I, I call this kind of diaper dependence, right? A baby can't even take care of themselves. They have to have their diaper changed. When they mess their pants, they can't even do anything about it. Maybe when they get a little older, they'll rip it off and smear it all over. And sometimes this happens in your homes and it's kind of disgusting, right? It's gross. But they are completely and utterly dependent. And that is how we come to Jesus. We don't come with a sense of independence or self-satisfaction or self-righteousness. We come to Jesus not basking in our own self-effort. That's going to fail. It's like a little two-month-old baby trying to change his own diaper. It's just not going to work. And so we recognize our total dependence. And Jesus loves kids and he loves babies. And that's that's a secondary truth here. And I love that, right? So when we sing this song, Jesus loves me, this I know, and we sing that to our children, it's true. He does love children. And he uses little children as an example of how we're supposed to approach God. And you might say, well, man, my little child is a piece of work, right? And they, they're, they, they're, all, they're all kinds of sinful nature, and they're doing all kinds of things. And I get that. But he's talking about this dependence. We all understand the little ones are dependent, and that's how we approach God. We recognize our total dependence. And Jesus is just sharing over and over again. And Luke is recording these little stories and little examples of how Jesus interacted over and over and over again. It's like he is hitting us on the head, reminding us salvation. Salvation is not something we earn. It's something that God graciously gives to us. Verse 18, and I put on your outlines, don't expect good works to qualify. Don't expect your good works to get you into the kingdom. But a guy shows up and asks Jesus this, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus asks a question back. As soon as Jesus does that and he asks a question back, you know, there's trouble. He says, well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. So already it's like, well, wait, isn't Jesus God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? And we get that. And Jesus is making a point because this ruler is coming not believing that Jesus is really God's Son. And he's going to talk about goodness, right? And Jesus isn't saying, well, I'm not good. He's just pointing this gentleman, this certain ruler, to God the Father. And he's going to talk about the good standard. And this is a guy that doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He says, let's talk about good. Why don't we do that? And he says, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. And so he mentions a whole bunch of them, and he, he leaves one out on purpose. And so the guy says, wow, all these I've kept since I was a boy. But there's that one other one that's a little harder at times, because some of these big ones just say, man, I haven't done the big ones, but that covet one is coming. And so Jesus responds again, because the guy says, I've done all that. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. And there's one commandment that he'd messed up on is that covetous spirit. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. So it's Jesus saying, okay, if you fulfill this commandment and this commandment and this, and you did all those, but if you, if you happen to do this one and you're not a covetous person, then you'll be in, you'll be good. No, Jesus is applying that standard of goodness, the personal good works to this ruler. He says, okay, if you want to approach God based on your own merits and something that you earn, then let's cover the one that you don't meet. And all of us have some of our lists. We'll say, man, I got that one, I got that one, I got that one, I got that one. And then Jesus says, I bet you don't have this one. And I put on your allies this, and this, because this, he's going to talk about this uh, 
interaction, we admit our perfection standard failure. We don't meet God's perfect standard, just like this ruler. And Jesus wasn't adding another requirement for salvation, but he was following this guy's requirement. Okay, if you want to do it by good works, let's find out how you don't make it. And Jesus' teaching is that no matter how good we are, there's going to be something we fail in, and we don't cut it. We're not going to make it. Don't expect our good works to qualify us for God's kingdom. And so we admit that if the standard is perfection, then we fail. Jesus looked at him, verse 24, and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And if you're out there and you're saying, well, man, I've got quite a bit of money in the bank. Um, I'm in trouble. Well, let's just look and see what he says. He says, indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Oh, you know, camels never fit in through the eye of a needle. It's like a proverbial saying. So it must be impossible. And it's this idea of extremely difficult. And so Jesus is catching something that's quite true with this guy who happened to be wealthy. And it, we, we don't expect our good works to qualify us, but we notice that worldly success here, and in this case wealth, or worldly status and success and fame and accomplishment and, and satisfaction with all the things I've got, obscures, obscures or hinders salvation and satisfaction. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Then those who heard, uh, who heard this asked, well, who then can be saved, right? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, well, we've left all we had to follow you. And truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age, that's in the physical life, and in the age to come, that's eternal life. So Jesus is catching a powerful truth that none of us make the perfection standard, that our worldly success tends to obscure not only salvation, and we catch that because we are become more and more self-reliant, and who needs God anyways? I, I don't need him to do anything for me. I've got it together. And, and, and we, we think we have it and we don't really worry about things. But notice it's also about life meaning and satisfaction because often we're, we're used to thinking, okay, I get, I trust in God now and then I have satisfaction in eternity with him. But Jesus catches a beautiful truth. Look at verse 30 again. That those who follow me they won't fail to receive many times as much in this age. And that's not just talking about, hey, if I follow Jesus, I'm going to get wealthy. No, that's not what he's saying. But if you want to be satisfied, true satisfaction now and in the age to come, you follow Jesus and you don't rely on your own personal success. You don't rely on your good works, but you receive forgiveness in Christ as a free gift. And then Jesus offers salvation for eternal life, satisfaction now and in the next life. So over and over and over again in this section, and it's going to go on, Jesus is teaching, don't trust, don't, be, don't trust your own self-effort. Don't be self-reliant. It's certainly going to fail. It won't work. I put on your outlines in red, do I admit my total inability to save myself? I can't do it. I can't save myself. And the disciples, and then and now, sometimes we think as wealthy people that well, they're more successful, they're smarter, they're, they're more worthy or something. And so the, the disciples asked, well, man, if this good guy who, who follows the rules and, and he's fairly wealthy, um, if he doesn't have what it takes, who does? And so, but Jesus says, what's impossible with man is it's possible with God. But first we got to admit, we are totally unable to save ourselves. Let's keep going. Jesus just keeps going and Luke keeps recording. Verse 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and he told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. 
And they're getting ready to head up the hill to Jerusalem. And he says, verse 32, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. And Luke records, you know, the disciples didn't understand any of this. And, and its meaning was hidden from them. And they didn't know what he was talking about. They just didn't quite get it. And he'd been announcing, I think this is the third time he'd announced that this was going to happen, but they didn't quite understand. And you know, if this first several stories is about being, be, being careful not to cling to self-effort, because that's the route of failure, now Jesus turns the corner, and Luke does as well as he records it, we cling to Jesus for certain rescue. And if our good works don't qualify, right, Jesus' suffering does qualify. And so we trust Jesus' suffering on our behalf to qualify for the kingdom. We don't make the cut with our, with our good works. We don't reach that perfection standard. But Jesus does. Jesus did. We are unable. Jesus is able. So we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to qualify for the kingdom. I love that. And look at verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside, and he was begging and when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they, they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and he, and he ordered the man, the man to be brought to him. And, and when he came near, Jesus asked him, well, what do you want me to do for you? He says, Lord. I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, saw it, they also praised God. You know, I love this because not only do we trust in Jesus' suffering to qualify for the, for the kingdom, but any good that we want to receive from Jesus is not through our good works. We receive good from Jesus through faith. This blind man was healed physically and spiritually through faith in Jesus Christ. And if we want good from Jesus, we don't try to impress him, right? I'm not sure Jesus is impressed by you. I know he's not impressed by me. See, we receive good from Jesus through faith faith, just like this blind man. And if we want good, if we want the good that Jesus has to offer here in this life or in the life to come, we do that in faith. Now my favorite section here, chapter 19, verse 1. We welcome Jesus as he welcomes you. We welcome Jesus as he welcomes you. Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. You know, we started our whole series with this little uh, story here right at the beginning of our study, you know, several months ago now. And Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector. Remember, tax collectors in their day, they kind of skimmed off the top. And if they were efficient, they got more of a commission. And, and so he was wealthy from being a tax collector. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he's kind of a shorty, right? And for guys, sometimes that's not, you know, ultra popular. And so he's short, and he is a tax collector. He's ostracized, and, and people are kind of lining up to see Jesus. And he's outside the crowd, and he's pushed away, and nobody really likes him. And he couldn't see over the crowd, so he runs ahead, verse 4, and he climbs a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And here's this guy that nobody particularly likes, and chances are he, he kind of skimmed off the top to make, make more and more money. And he's a lost and needy person that other people just don't really appreciate. And they just kind of push him off to the side because he's smaller. He says, I don't care if you can't see. Why would Jesus bother with you? I put on your outlines this. Come to Jesus as a lost and needy person. You know, folks, we don't have to come uh, to Jesus and impress him with our credentials. We don't have to come to Jesus as a as a person of strength and, and, and a size and prestige and fame and success, boldly walking in on our two feet as if we're going to impress God our Father. No. 
we come to Jesus as a lost and needy person. I love what Zacchaeus does. Man, I can't even get close. I'm lost. I can't even see over the crowd. But I think he's coming this way. Maybe if I, I go up here, Jesus will find me. Verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, and you got to love this, folks. And this is our story. This is your story when you respond in faith. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he, that's Zacchaeus, he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Jesus finds Zacchaeus. Among all the other people and all the impressive people and all the front row people, and Zacchaeus is in the back row and he has to climb a tree because he can't even see and people just shoved him and pushed him out of the way. Jesus says, you know, Zacchaeus, I see you and I want relationship with you. Come down here. I put on your allies this, that we receive Jesus with joy as he finds us, right? Jesus is seeking us. He's looking for us. And he says, hey, there you are. I see you. Come down and join me. I want to welcome you in. And then Zacchaeus welcomes him back in faith. He came down at once and he's, he's joyous. He's glad. He says, oh, what? Me? I mean, he's probably looking around the tree. Is like, somebody else up here? He says, no, he's, he's calling to me. That lost and needy one. And Zacchaeus comes down. Now, Jesus is much more gracious than we are. If you're here and, and you're listening and you're a longtime Christian, sometimes this, us, this is us. And we think, well, Zacchaeus or whatever the Zacchaeus person is in your life, you fill in the blank that, that person that's not worthy, worthy, that person that's annoying, that person could never respond to the gospel, the one that God should overlook. And a lot of times Christians are much less gracious than, than God is. And we see that with God's people here. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, he's gone to the, be the guest of a sinner. Why, why in the world would Jesus associate with Zacchaeus? But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here, now, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, he might have, right? I will pay back four times the amount. And so Jesus declares, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man. And here's that beautiful verse that summarizes the whole gospel of Luke. For the son of man, that's Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. I put on your outlines this, we show our faith in Jesus and we show our fellowship with Jesus, right? Zacchaeus responds, he says, yes, Jesus, and he invites him and Jesus welcomes Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus welcomes him back and, and, and now there's this fellowship in, the, in Zacchaeus' home and we show our faith and fellowship with Jesus through repentance. And there's this act of repentance and change. And Zacchaeus is changed. And you notice that he was a wealthy guy too. The other wealthy guy left, right? And didn't really respond to Jesus. Here's this guy that responds. So it is possible. Everything is possible with God. And he responds in faith. He communes, he fellowships with Jesus. And it changes him. And he's like, hey, I got to give everything half away. And if I've cheated anybody, I'm going, to, I'm going to give back four times the amount. And so Jesus is able to declare, yes, salvation has come to this lost and needy, despised and rejected person. How about you and me? Do I accept Jesus' desire and ability to save me? See, the bad news of the gospel is that we got to accept that we are totally unable to save ourselves. But the good news of the gospel is Jesus desires to find us. He's looking up in that tree. He says, hey, come down. Come down. And he is able to save us. What we can't do, Jesus does for us through the death, burial, and resurrection for forgiveness of sins. There's a little song that sometimes we sing with our children, and I even sang it when I was a kid, so it's been around a while. 
You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Remember that song? Wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. For the Lord he's going to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. We often put, please. For I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. Remember that? Maybe you haven't heard that one, but uh, lots of children have. You know, folks, Jesus, that's not just a song for children. Jesus is knocking at the door. Is he knocking at the door of your house today? Has he found you? But instead of being rescued, are you hiding in shame or, or fear or afraid that he's going to overlook or that I'm not worthy or maybe you feel like you're, you're too worthy and you don't need what Jesus has to offer. I can save myself, whatever it might be. And Jesus says, I'm coming to your house today. Are you going to invite me in? And receive as a free gift forgiveness and mercy offered in Jesus Christ. See, do I accept that Jesus desires to rescue us because he loves us? And do I believe that he has the complete ability to save even me? Will you pray with me, please? Father, thank you so much for the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that it's a free gift and we cling to what Jesus has done on our behalf. We don't trust our own standard and our own works. That is the route to failure and separation from you. But we trust and we enjoy and, and with gladness as you welcome us, we welcome you back. And then, Father, our faith in Christ grows and we invite him in and he resides in our heart and, and we're fellowshipping, we're eating around the table and, and it, our life is changed. And we have this life of repentance and change and active change that reflects our close fellowship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Thank you so much that you seek and you save those who are lost. We are lost, but we are found in Jesus Christ. Amen. HCC family, I love you. I care about you. If someone's listening and you're not sure, you're not absolutely sure you've been found by Jesus, you know, call me, uh, send me an email, stop by. I'd love to talk to you and pray with you. Um, there's others in our church that would be happy to connect with you. Just to affirm God's great love for you and his desire his deep desire to find you and to save you and be in close relationship with you. God bless you.